Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to our session. Um, my name is Audrey Selly, and I'll be serving as uh, moderator of this discussion uh, today. And um, I am uh, I'm sh I'm sharing the the stage here with uh, a group of esteemed uh, colleagues. Um, who uh, m and many of us know each other already quite well over the years, and uh, today's today's discussion is is going to focus uh, a little bit on um, uh, on our experiences as as uh, active practitioners, uh, as 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 impact investors, and we'll be looking uh, at this from a little bit in the beginning of the discussion uh, from a life cycle perspective, um, starting from um, those of us who look at angel and early stage uh, opportunities uh, on through the growth and more um, mature uh, social enterprises uh, that, uh, that, that, that appear for us in the various markets in which we're active. So for those of, us, for those of you who know us, you'll notice that we are sitting in order of, in rough order of uh, the, our, our interest areas. And I would like to start with just uh, having each, each, each one of you say a little bit about um, where you're coming from, the fund, and so on, to introduce to the audience. Um, and include, please, um, the rough, uh, the areas of interest, um, geographical and otherwise, and your ticket size, um, at, you know, sort of ranges, and uh, what, it is that you, what it is that you look for. Excellent. And I, I'll point out we're, we're in order, and it's, it's only fitting that it's only fitting that the person who moderates a network of different stages of investors is also our moderator. So you are, you are in the right place, Audrey. Um, uh, my name is Ross Baird, and I run an organization called Village Capital, and we do, um, we do educational capacity building programs as well as investment in uh, seed stage entrepreneurs. And I would define that specifically um, as entrepreneurs that have a product, have a good or a service, people are buying um, very much in and past the validation stage that we saw in the last session, um, but typically haven't raised any money from anybody else. Um, typically, maybe one to three people on the team. We've gone as early as an idea on paper, though I've done 24 investments in the last three and a half years, and only one of them has been an idea on paper, but um, we will typically invest before these other folks here will. Um, we can talk more about what we do later, but that's that's where I am. Um, have done things all over the world, um, but very focused on the specific stage of development of the venture. Okay, thank you. My name is Nicholas Hutter. I'm the European Director for Tonic. Um, Tonic is a global network of impact investors. We are 40 um, members across the globe, about two thirds in the US and uh, one third in Europe. Um, we've been around for 18 months. In those 18 months, we've done 19 transactions, um, ranging between 50,000 euros or dollars to about 3 million. The median size is 800,000. Uh, all stages, um, slightly later stage, I would say, than than Ross, not not the idea stage, but also seed uh, and startup. I would say is the is is the majority, and we also invest in funds. Um, and if you put all the capital that our members have committed to investing into impact together, uh, it would be more than hundred million dollars. Good afternoon. My name is Oliver Carius. I represent LGT Venture Philanthropy, I'm sitting in the middle because we do early expansion stage funding in the range of 200,000 up to a million. Some call this the valley of death, or some call it sort of that kind of funding. Uh, we do that on a global basis in Latin America, Africa, India, Southeast Asia, and China. Uh, we're five years old. Uh, average investment size is around 500,000. We do grants, debt, and equity, depending on the underlying need of the organization. We have um, done 22 investments so far. Um, we haven't done an exit yet, I mean, in the sense that we can talk about financial returns. Um, and we are, we are working with early, earlier stage deals for the pipeline. And we're also looking to, to work with other investors to where we can hand over our deals later on for follow-up investments. And I'm uh, Paul Dale of uh, Voxtra. Uh, we have um, a fund that we established in November last year uh, to invest in uh, agribusinesses in East Africa uh, that um, enable uh, poor smolder farmers to increase their productivity and uh, incomes. Um, we invest typically uh, around a million to one and a half uh, dollars. 
Uh, our bracket is half a million up to two million. Uh, we can do anything from debt to equity. Uh, we have a private equity-like setup, uh, but with slightly longer time horizons and slightly more flexibility in the way we deploy capital. Um, so uh, we will invest in about 10 companies over the coming years. Uh, we expect some of them to be uh, early growth stage, and that's an overlap with Oliver, uh, while some of them will be a bit more mature uh, companies where we'll join forces with others and invest slightly larger amounts. Um, we also have a, a technical assistance facility, which is uh, uh, one of the uh, tools that we use to be able to support um, enterprises that uh, still have some hurdles to, to cross in terms of uh, uh, making it uh, in terms of uh, uh, financial viability and, and sort of laying the foundations for growth. Thank you. Um, I should also mention that uh, um, I, I've, I work for a family office called uh, Rianta Capital, and as a part of that, um, as a part of the mandate of the impact investment initiative that they started in 2007, I would probably be sitting somewhere between Nicholas and Oliver, actually, if we were truly sitting in order, if I wasn't moderating. And we look at, uh, but very small deal flow. Um, uh, in terms of uh, ticket size, so anywhere between 50 and 500, and um, early growth stage companies. We've only done uh, a handful of investments. We're on our eighth at the moment. Uh, so it's, um, I think, on some level, uh, we are representative of uh, an opportunity area where there are a vast number of family offices and private wealth funds attempting to find ways and entrees into how to deploy capital alongside the more established the networks the and and, and the, the proper sort of venture philanthropy teams and um, and organizations out there so um, I mean that this this I think as soon as you put a panel of us um, together uh, this begs the question of well how are we able to work together if at all uh, I thought it would be interesting that maybe we have we share a little bit about examples where uh, successful examples of of co-invests of, of syndication, and perhaps Ross can start with that. Sure. Um, thanks. Thanks a lot, Audrey. Uh, I think that um, that one of the things that we have seen um, is is that it's absolutely critical, um, and I think, Audrey, you're, you're, you're exactly right, like it's absolutely critical if you're a family office or a foundation or, or a very small fund like us. Um, syndication and collaboration is critical because there's, there's just not enough money to go around otherwise. Um, of the 24 investments, um, we have gotten other investors involved either at the same time that we invested or later in 21 of them. Um, Two of the three remaining are no longer in business, and I don't think that that's uh, a coincidence. Um, it, and and I think from our standpoint, it comes with it, it comes from from two perspectives why that's really important. Number one is different investors add value in different ways. Um, we actually uh, briefly how our how our investment is done. We run accelerator programs for entrepreneurs. At the end of each program, the entrepreneurs actually rank one another, and we pre-commit capital to the top ranked uh, as picked by their peers. It's a bit of a different investment model, and we can go into it later if you're interested. But um, what it really means is we're, we do a high volume of investments at a pretty light engagement per investment, which means that if we co-invest with other investors, there are two pairs of hands on a company rather than one. So we just wrapped up a program in Brazil where uh, we pre-committed half of the capital to the pool. We committed $100,000 to two companies. We put in 50,000 of that. Vox Capital, an impact investment fund, committed 50,000 of that. And we are now invested alongside Vox Capital in two companies. We can bring a bit of a global network, help with fundraising, help with basic business documents. They can help a lot more operationally since they're located in Sao Paulo next to where the companies are, and, and we're not. So that would be one bit of collaboration. I think a second bit of collaboration is um, we will come in before these guys, but we are always talking to these guys about what we have in our portfolio that they may be interested in six, nine, 12 months down the line. So I just spoke with one of Oliver's colleagues in India, um, said, look, I know you go six to 12 months to analyze a company sometime. I have a company that is definitely not ready for investment from you now, but you should 
maybe put them on your radar so that by the time you're comfortable investing in the company, they're ready for the, the money. So we think ahead when we have a company or portfolio, who here would be interested and, and get them in touch early and often? Yeah, I think um, rather than share uh, examples, I would say that collaboration and uh, co-investment is deeply ingrained in the DNA of Tonic because that's why we were why we're there. So we even define a tonic deal as a deal where at least uh, two or more members co-invest. So those 19 deals are not all the deals that the tonic members made. I'll give you one example. One of the co-founders of tonic is Charlie Kleisner, and together with his wife, uh, Lisa Kleisner, they operate through Kale Felicitas Foundation. It, and um, so Charlie and Lisa participated in five of those transactions, of so those 19, but in the same time, they did 23 out of their foundation. Yeah, so. Um, it's just a, that um, what, to mirror what uh, what Ross has said, um, collaboration and syndication is really the key here because uh, that's how you share resources. And a lot of those deals are relatively early stage. The transaction costs, however, are fixed. Almost uh, it doesn't matter whether you invest uh, fifty thousand or five hundred thousand. Uh, the effort is the same, and and therefore, if you can spread that, uh, that's great. And this is what we're trying to do with Tonic. Perhaps just to add, <clears throat> since we're sitting here, depending on, on the, the kind of stage of the venture, I think it's also to bear in mind that it's not, that's not just the stage, but it's also the type of capital that is available. So you could be providing, like what Simon is doing with the Shell Foundation, it's it really crit critical grant funding, but really sizable grant funding that comes into the early expansion stage. So it's also at the stage looking at the different layers of capital that is available and that is absolutely critical and needed for a venture. Um, just two examples, perhaps quickly, on how to reduce transaction costs. We did a deal in East Africa called Bridge International Academy, together with the Hilti Foundation, uh, with DOB, and um, at that time another family foundation. And in those first five months on do doing due diligence, we basically just shared everything that we saw. Because there's, no, there's very little added value um, everybody asking, so what's your track record? You know, what are your impact numbers? I mean, that to try and then become very really smart um, in, in reducing those transaction costs, and that worked really well. We saved over 50,000 in legal costs because one of the, the group members had done um, fantastic legal due diligence to Clifford Chance, and they just passed it around. It would have been absolutely zero added value from our side if we would have to do the same thing. And that, that worked really well. Um, why did it work well? Because we all had the same kind of um, alignment and the same way of, of doing deals. And I think that's a pretty important um, component in, if you really want to move together. And, and I think that's a great example um, that this space is still a very collaborative space with people who are general, genuinely focused on impact and, and therefore they're open, open to sharing uh, their work and, and working together. Um, <clears throat> so for all the talk about lack of investment opportunities, um, you know, that's not really what we're seeing. Um, if there was a lack of investment opportunities and too much capital chasing it at this stage, uh, people would probably behave a bit more competitively. Uh, so although it's still difficult to find good deals, it's not like uh, people sort of have, have changed over to that uh, very competitive and commercial mindset. We're still sort of having a lot of, um, of the culture of the uh, more philanthropic side uh, in the way we relate to each other. I would not totally agree with that statement because uh, I agree that uh, the space is very collaborative, but I wouldn't say that there isn't a lack of, of investment opportunities. There's a lot of great projects, but uh, there's very few investable deals. And the reason why the prices are not going up is not because uh, uh, there's too much capital chasing. It's because the capital is actually not chasing. And contrary to the private equity industry where you've got limited partners who say, hey, you're not deploying our capital. Either get it out there or give it back. Um, there's not much pressure in this industry for the capital to actually be deployed because it's it's patient in the sense that uh, you know sitting in foundations there's not there's not a, a, an allocation pressure as you have in the in the more commercial investment uh, space. That's I would say is the reason why the prices are not going up because the capital is actually not chasing the deals. And that that actually underlies. Um kind of the double-edged sword of what it is that we're dealing with in terms of this type of capital. The fact that it's patient obviously differentiates it, but at the same time, there there is a remarkable lack of urgency around um, deployment, at least in, you know, w internally within certain institutions. I, I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't want to generalize, but 
um, the fact that we can sit as a consortium of three, four, or five investors for nine months on a given on a deal, um, just swapping back and forth, and this is very much the reality in our in, in well, my experience. I, I'm sure the more efficient organizations would would find different would have different stories to tell, but um, that creates. Yeah, well, that that actually that's a really good segue into um, the next uh, one of the other topics that I think would be worth broaching as we sit here together. Um, there's and this was brought up by somebody in a previous uh, session um, that uh, that was asking about accountability uh, on the part of investors. Now, certainly as investors, perhaps not as family offices, but as investors who raise funds from. Um, from from different entities and who then go on to deploy them, um, there is uh, obviously a lot of reporting, a lot of a, a lot of system and a lot of infrastructure in place to support accountability. Um, we must also be accountable to those that we invest in. Um, you know, what what do we have in place to ensure that um, when an entrepreneur entrusts us with his or her plan uh, and with his or her baby, effectively? Um, half the time they don't really necessarily know who they're dealing with. Um, are they dealing with a very uh, experienced portfolio manager? Um, they may not be. Um, and so we've seen several instances where it's simply a matter of the lack of experience on the investor side, on the investor consortium side, where an entrepreneur may actually flounder in the process of waiting for sort of the, you know, things to come together on, on the money side. So I was just wondering if any of you would, would speak to to that um, in any in any context, yeah, I'd say it's it's really. Um, I agree. I think that investor consortiums move very slow, um, very very slowly. Um, it's 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 one of the reasons why we pre-commit capital because we're dealing with businesses that if they don't get fifty thousand dollars in two months, they'll. Die. Now, you know, fortunately, businesses at this stage where they're getting half a million to three million usually have enough cash to where they can wait through a nine month investor consortium. So there's not the same sense of urgency, but like, I guess to, to put a spin on what you're saying, um, what I have seen actually gets deals closed is usually one investor who is actually an advocate for the entrepreneur saying, look, we need to get this done by May 1st or this company won't be able to pay people on May 15th. And I think that typically that, in my experience, has tended to be a person who's an entrepreneur themselves, who has raised money and faced that time pressure themselves, who says, look, I have been where this person is and I know that they are in big trouble if we don't get this done. I think that one of the reasons why there isn't a lot of seed capital and also isn't a lot of urgency on the investor side is most it, it, it's rare for an impact investor to be someone who made their own money running a social enterprise because there aren't a lot of people who've made their own money running a social enterprise so in uh in contrast with the tech world where most of the people putting money in made it doing the exact same thing N not very many people doing the investing have done the exact same thing on the other side. So I don't know. I think it's um, it's a it's a an, it's an accountability, but it's also a, a shared experience. A lot of us don't have haven't been, you know, trying to make payroll in a social enterprise facing the same impact accountability too. But but the the question and the big the big elephant in the room right now is this this generalization that it takes long. It, it doesn't take long. Some deals you can do, uh, the quickest that we've done is two months, start to finish. That was because a lot of the information was there already. The longest deal we're sitting on is one year. Um, it's not because we are slow or the, the deal is slow, because things have changed so much in the business model that their capitalization needs are suddenly so different. And we need, just need to invest a bit more time to really understand to do the Series A closing. Now, if you suddenly have a Series A and you have a lead investor, then that's very, very quick. Right. I mean, so it, it depends really entirely on. Uh, well, it depends a lot on, on the kind of sector, but on, on the deal. And I think to your question around what's important for us is, it's I call it finance plus. It's not about writing a check. And I think the, the onus is really on us to show the entrepreneur that we can collectively in the industry add more value by bringing experts, by making the relevant introductions to networks, to bringing other capital, whatever it is. Because writing a check is really easy. 
but it doesn't mean that you're then allocating the right capital for the right purpose, and you have to bring in all that additional value. Uh, otherwise, the you know, entrepreneur goes shopping, and he goes like, same capital, but you add you know, five times more value, I'll go with you because you're my preferred partner. And that's a really healthy thing, I think, that's, that needs to happen. Well, there's, a, there's a study, it's a bit old, but just to give you an order of magnitude, that uh, um, the best venture capital firms in the US, they get a 14% discount on average uh, on, on the deals because people would want to work with them uh, because they know they add so much value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I thought I would just mention uh, while we're on the subject that um, uh, the, one of the projects that we've undertaken at Rianta has been to launch uh, a platform dedicated to impact investors called Artha. And um, this is basically a repository that allows us to capture, in theory, not yet in practice, but to capture um, the due diligence information as we go along so that, uh, well, Oliver, I think we might beat you in terms of um, length of due diligence uh, record. Ours was 18 months. I mean, it took almost two years to deploy capital into one business because it was changing so much. We would just we couldn't get a handle on it. And it finally did happen, and it happened with two other investors. But um, had we had um, the ability to, I guess, share the information more effectively, unfortunately, like the simplest exchanges where it, just, it, it could just be a matter of a couple of phone calls and a lot of emails, um, it, everybody is um, willingly um, collaborative and very, very open. But the actual practice and the actual um, exchange of meaningful information is, is actually um, quite sparse and difficult to mainstream. And so that's one of the challenges, I think, that the Arthur platform is one tool, one of many tools out there, um, possibly as a virtual uh, component of a more robust um, you know, like a real network, like like Tonic um, does. So um, I just I just thought I'd you know, as you were speaking, I was thinking um, if I was a, so if I was an entrepreneur sitting in the audience now listening to us, um, what would be running through my head? And um, so I would like to ask you know all of you to weigh in on this idea of what's in the best interest of the entrepreneur to deal with a bunch of us uh, as investors together, or you know. Is it better one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, in terms of value, you know, input, you know, inputs per output? Anyone? <laughs> well, I think you could view that from many different uh, angles, and uh, uh, I think Ross already said uh, one important part of that is different funders add different types of value, and therefore it can be highly beneficial to have several funders. Uh, supporting an entrepreneur. Um, on the other hand, that can create complexity also, uh, disagreements on the board. Um, and uh, I know of entrepreneurs who have struggled when they've been facing a consortium where the investors are very close to each other and they sort of agree everything up front and then they come and present the entrepreneur with a fait accompli. Um, so it all depends, I guess, on the situation and the setup um, and, and you know, how the sort of deal and the investment plays out over time. I, I, I want to stress one thing um, that I, I always say to entrepreneurs, which is before you go to investors, figure out exactly how much money you need and what you need it for. There's an investor who I really enjoy working with, and his big thing where he adds value and what he really cares about is human capital. So if he says, okay, of your budget, how, many of that, how much of that is dedicated to new hires? How much do you need to pay them? Who would you hire, et cetera? And he works it out, and if he wants to invest, he'll say, you know, I will put in $109,000, because that will fund this position for two years at the current salary you've got. And I'm gonna get very involved in helping you find this person, because he's got an executive search background. Um, so to say to that entrepreneur, look, like, like if you didn't have this guy's 109,000, would you still want to work with him in executive search? And the answer is probably yes, because he's really good at it. Um, so first of all, you don't, I don't think you need to raise as much money as you think. Get very clear about what it's for. Second of all, look at who's going to add value in each of those um, areas that you really need. I think, um, say, if, the, the question, if you weren't bringing money to the table, would I still want you in the game is, is a really important one. I just want to share um, 
when we started out, we looked at what the entrepreneurs need, and they said, okay, that's, it's the right funding at the right stage in the right form. The second is that we felt like a lot of entrepreneurs that we work with in this early expansion stage, even if you would give them two million, they wouldn't know to, to, to bring that capital to work because they don't have the structures and the processes to actually absorb that capital to then um, develop the impact. So we set up a fellowship program, it's called ICATS, uh, where it's basically that one of the design principles is that the, our investee can upload job descriptions of people that they think they need in order to reach their next targets onto a platform and then we have people with relevant business expertise, hopefully, who apply on that platform. We do the pre-screening and then the, 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 our investee actually chooses what the best person is to come work for them for 11 months. So this is not Mai Tai volunteering, sitting on a beach having a great experience. This is actually taking someone with relevant business expertise into the organization and working on something which is more structural rather than you know body leasing or painting the ceiling or whatever it is. So that when they leave after 11 months, they, they, the venture actually has gained and improved structures, etc. And for us, that's it's been one of the differentiating factors is this, uh, that the investees come to us and say, yes, we give you, you, we're interested in your capital, but we're also really interesting to be part of the ICATS program because we really struggle to find the engineer or that expert if you work in northern India and Bihar uh, or in somewhere in Africa or in Latin America. So that's been a really important component of, um, of, our, of our approach. I wonder if you could say a few words as well about your Impact Ventures Accelerator program. <coughs> that's, that's an example where we, in Southeast Asia over the last four years we've had uh, we haven't seen investable deals. We've seen a lot of s projects, but not enough investable deals. So we are working, w this year we started working with four social enterprise incubators in Southeast Asia, where we actually do are developing an accelerator program. So we, we take the most promising ventures that they have, put in uh, an ICAT fellow as management expertise, provide some grant funding, um, and hopefully over the next you know, 18 to 24 months, make them more investable for us to invest or for others to invest and then open that up to a local angel network. So in that, that's an example in a region where we're probably more leaning to this side uh, because we need to do something to create that, that pipeline. It's not going to emerge from nowhere. I wonder if, um, if we could get in a little bit into a, a discussion around, given that um, we, we are each applying a slightly different lens, uh, never mind um, a slightly different probably diligence method or process. Um, I think in I've, I've, I've worked directly with, with funds who have um, very, very soft touch diligence and others who are extremely stringent. I wonder if, if you might all comment um, respectively on um, what it is that you think sort of differentiates your appraisal process um, as per the, 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 the sort of the target that you set. Sure. Uh, well, ours is uh, ours is totally peer based. Um, how I first got into investing was uh, I worked actually for an enterprise and then went to go work for the investor who had invested in the enterprise. He's a guy named Bob Patillo, who you may know of. He founded a firm called Grey Ghost Ventures, and he would be like out in that hallway in terms of like risk tolerance in here. He's like the most risk tolerant person in the impact world, um, and he. Uh, he invests kind of like if he likes a person, he go for it. Um, if you catch him on a good day, you might hit the lottery. Uh, and and um, we were thinking around, okay, can you get a little more scientific than that? Um, if because if you because we were thinking, okay, Bob wants to do angel investments, but we also want to create a model where other people might want to come in. And how do you do it at scale? You can't hire analysts if you're doing fifty thousand dollar investments and do thorough diligence because then you spend. $60,000 to make a 50,000 investment and the math just doesn't add up. So um, uh, the idea that came out of that was turned into the venture that I now run called Village Capital, which is uh, if you have a baseline of qualifications, which has evolved into post-revenue, somebody is buying something, you have a strong management team, which is, which is again just kind of a baseline guess, uh, you have a basic financial plan, we have 15 companies that go into a program, we actually say, well, what if, what, if, what if the peers decided? So we have a structured curriculum peer review process where over three months, actually entrepreneurs themselves build one another's ventures, but also assess each other, and we invest in who the entrepreneurs pick. We don't 
know if they do better or worse than analysts. We know that the entrepreneur pick portfolio is outperforming the analyst pick portfolio right now. Um, I was on the team of analysts that, that picked the portfolio, so maybe that has something to do with it. Um, but we do know it's way, way cheaper. So um, all this is to say, if you're going with different types of uh, investments, which is earlier stage than the market can probably bear, um, you need to do some innovation somewhere. And peer selection is the big innovation that, that, that we developed, thinking that um, when, you're, when you're in the earlier stages, it's really all about the caliber of the entrepreneur and team anyway, because none of these businesses that in my portfolio, if we took them to you for investment, would look the same in six to 12 months. So that's that's the, the bet that we've made, and it's, it's, it's going along well, but, but again, it's, it's a total experiment. I can't really comment because uh, the approach uh, uh, that we have is so diverse. Um, it really depends on the um, on our members, and we have a <coughs> very diverse membership in the sense that uh, LGT Venture Philanthropy is one of our members, and they're probably one of the most sophisticated impact investors in the world, and we also have people who are, are single individuals <coughs> coming very new to the space and want to learn and this is also this mix of, uh, of people in our network also allows for disseminating knowledge and best practices and we are also now uh, we have a, a non-profit arm the tonic institute which serves to codify these processes and disseminate them make them public and open source them so we're writing one report now which is going to come out in the course of this year on how to run a, uh, an angel network and um, we also did uh, best practice dissemination among our members in terms of doing due diligence. And uh, so it really depends on who's doing it, uh, what the size of the deal is. Um, and it can be from very thorough to shoot from the hip like Bob Patillo, who's also a member. <laughs> we, 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 look at f we look at four things. We, we have a fairly um, in-depth process. Uh, it's just that we, because we have to offer our investments to, first we want, need to, we want to understand them, but we also want to offer them to other clients. So we, we're part of a bank um, and are offering um, those, those investment opportunities to the clients of the bank as well. So it's not just the, the money of the princely family that we can invest directly, but other capital as well. But we have four things. One is, of course, business quality. But I think the, the important thing is, let's link to this ICATS program, is to really understand the internal capabilities of an organization and do, the, do that on a real, in a really structured way. Um, and we use that as a tool to assess where the organization, what, where, where they feel they need support and where we feel they should, need, uh, should have support. That's become a really in interesting engagement tool. So that's the inside out, really understanding, like a doctor does a 360 capabilities assessment, and then the impact assessment and risk assessment. And then in each, we just, in our investment process, we just go deeper, we drill deeper into each of these four areas as, as we progress. So it means it's none of this is rocket science. It's just you have to, you know, have to be able to ask the right kind of questions to assess the, try to minimize the downside risks and, um, on the impact side, make sure that this, this deal so meets the impact criteria. Is it not working? Yeah. Um, uh, so, so we have a uh, an experienced venture capitalist on our investment committee uh, who heads that, and we have a very experienced private equity uh, person that's our chairman. So uh, our due diligence uh, methodology is very much, you know, from uh, that world. Uh, of course, adapted to the reality that we're doing smaller deals and we can't, you know, commission consultants to do marketing studies, etc. cetera. Um, but it's a, a fairly standard uh, private equity type um, due diligence process where we uh, drill down into the most important parts of the uh, business case and the underlying assumptions and trying to understand where this can, can fly. Um, and, and looking at the various dimensions that I think Oliver has already uh, described quite well. Um, what we put on top of that, of course, is uh, an assessment of the potential impact. So our impact bottom line is increased incomes for farmers. Uh, and so we have a, uh, a, um, a methodology that we developed together with a pro bono team from the Boston Consulting Group a few years ago uh, for our venture philanthropy work that we were doing in our foundation back then. Um, about how to um, uh, assess the effects and attribute various effects uh, of uh, an investment uh, in terms of uh, um, how, how much will incomes increase and um, uh, what sort of social return investment does that add up to uh, compared to uh, the investment that we're making. 
Uh, before we turn over to the audience for questions, and I'd like to actually um, ask you all to, to to participate. We'd like to make this a little bit more interactive, and you know, um, give us yeah, give us your best shot. I think that's um, before before we before we do that. I just wanted to make a comment around um, the fact that there are uh, there are gaps right between where each of us sit. Um, and naturally, the universe of 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 funding and donors is very wide and there's there's almost something out there for almost every kind of every kind of request but what have you seen um, out there that um, that helps us address these financing gaps people you know enterprises that may sit on every platform and on every you know that are on every radar uh, and that somehow still um, it's it seems like there's like a tipping point uh, in time over at which uh, an enterprise is either pounced upon by six at a time, uh, funders or donors, uh, or uh, just kind of is is out there, but nobody's biting. Um, and so I would consider those the types that kind of fall through the cracks. Now, what can we do as a community of donors um, and to, to kind of help them along, aside from, of course, the capacity building and TA that uh, would probably help bring them to the point where they are palatable because not everybody's going to be investable right um, there are some things that just aren't good good deals so um, but any, any comments from my panelists yeah I would say I would say I can't echo enough um, just sitting in the world that I do uh, the last panel on the role of philanthropy um, just because like on its face the investments that we're investing in today are not smart bets. I would not put my kids retire, or I would not put my own retirement or my kids' college into them. Um, our operations are paid for by philanthropy and scholarships. Um, our investment fund, um, we do provide a return to investors, but we raise program-related investments. We raise philanthropic capital. Um, and I would say, I, when, when I was running Village Capital as an experiment working for Grey Ghost Ventures and went out to explore if could turn into a separate thing, I asked both commercial investors and philanthropists, and there was kind of crickets and no no response from commercial investors. And from philanthropists, there was a few people there were a few people said, this is great, this is really interesting, this would fill some gaps. So I'd say, um, and they came from very unusual places. Like uh, we were able to fund a program in Atlanta because the city of Atlanta put up a third of the investment capital um, as a as a as a soft loan. So I'd say um, the 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 usual suspects at this conference probably only do about 5% of the funding of the enterprises in my universe and probably get 95% of the asks. So the most specific response to you is, is, is go to people who have never heard of this. You may have a place or a sector tied to what you're working on and just say, hey, I'm a really interesting business uh, working in agriculture in Africa and X you know, person in, in Nairobi may be, may be interested. That, I, I've seen a lot more of that be successful because we are, we're, we're active, but we have limited dollars. Um, maybe I can put that a bit into context. Uh, there was uh, this uh, report from the GIN and uh, JP Morgan, which was cited in one of the panels before. And uh, those of you who've uh, seen it may have uh, noted that uh, uh, impact investing is a five billion industry now, and it's uh, expected to grow tenfold over the next uh, uh, two, three years to 500 billion. That sounds really impressive, but that's less than 1% of global financial assets. So in the grand scheme of things, although great that this is what we're doing and fun and laudable and, and important, it's hippie shit. Yeah. So the question is, how can we get into those 99%? And I think that uh, um, we need to look at those big pools of money uh, that really move the needle. And um, uh, I can just, uh, um, again, uh, support what you're saying that uh, um, somebody has to blaze the trail and uh, I would say this is uh, um, mission driven money from philanthropic uh, sources and also from the public uh, money who should be blazing that trail. The trouble is I mean for the philanthropic market it is very fragmented, it's also very in uh, intransparent um, and also um, very often what I see in more traditional 
places where investment doesn't play a role, like in, in Austria, for instance, or, or in Germany, um, philanthropic um, donors, they think that they're destroying the mission if they think in investor terms and actually ask for something in return because uh, you're, you're smothering the good intention that you have. So there's, I think there's some um, silo breaking down to be done there. And then on the, on the public side, the development banks, for instance, um, they have a problem that their footprint is way too big. I mean, that's their mission, but how do you break it down so that they can invest in uh, in, in village capital? You have to, or like 20, 50, 100,000, or even just 1 million. Yeah? The Austrian Development Bank can't do anything that is less than 3 million. It's one of the smallest players in the market. Yeah? And as uh, Oliver has said before, um, there's very few people out there who have that absorptive capacity yet. So I think uh, that's something. How can we get into those 99% rather than even if, if we grow tenfold over the next 10 years, then we're 1%. Yeah. But that's not going to move the needle. Occupy SoCap. I said Occupy SoCap. <laughs> I, I think we, we are in a very interesting space right now in this sector because on the one hand, um, the finance industry sometimes really does work like sheep. So there's a great deal and everybody follows. Um, but we also have to remind ourselves that we are, I mean, we have to deploy risk capital into new deals that the mainstream doesn't actually look, look for. And I'm sometimes very critical if we sort of say, let's mainstream the sector. What does mainstreaming mean? It's sort of a run to the m lowest common denominator. That's mainstreaming, um, in, in a way. But I think for us as a sector, and we see that a lot, we, using the local teams on the ground, we want to support the local entrepreneurs. And that you can only find those if you really go out and you have to do some digging and you have to go to the banks, ask them. Because that's the traditional form of funding in most, in most countries, and saying, what do you see? Because otherwise, we, we're always following the same kind of deals and we are not... Um, and then what happens is the, the kind of critical analysis of the deals also doesn't happen. I mean, some of the things that we have looked at, you open the bonnet and there's no engine. It's, it's a wonderful car, but there's nothing to fund there. So it's like, oh my goodness, we thought this enterprise actually was far, far more advanced than it actually is. So then we have to go to ba back to base and actually, okay, what, what do we now need to do to ramp this up? So it, it's, a, it's a really exciting time and I think the... Um, the balance of mainstreaming absolutely to get more capital in while not losing the sight that we actually need to support the innovative high-risk ventures that are creating new business models where there's no benchmark, right? But we need to have the appetite to actually support those. Yeah, and that's, that's probably the, the biggest um, uh, funding gap. It's, it is in the early stage, it is in uh, developing new models. Just like the, you know, the the panel that was in this room uh, before us uh, talked about, um, but there are other gaps as well. Uh, we've been discussing working capital. Why doesn't that somebody put up a working capital facility that uh, um, growing social enterprises can tap into? It's a type of capital that's difficult to find. Um, another gap that we're seeing is, uh, you know, where are uh, the people who are gonna take some of uh, uh, of us funds out of the deals uh, so we can realize returns and get them back to investors and sort of prove that this works. Um, w when we invest in, say, a million or two in a company uh, and it grows for, uh, for five or six or seven years, uh, mo our most likely exit is to sell back to um, the entrepreneur. Um, and the there are some private equity funds out there that could be uh, interested in uh, in buying these companies. Um, but most of the capital that's put into that space today is from the development finance institutions. Um, and uh, they want to be additional, they don't want to take anybody out. So that's also uh, a sort of a missing link that would be important in getting more capital in because then you could prove that exits are possible, make it easier to, to attract investors. I agree. I mean, there's a lot. Exit is going to be a huge issue. Yeah. And uh, two things that you mentioned just uh, um, triggered uh, my response here. Uh, one is that uh, Working Capital Fund, there is actually such a product out there. It's an East Coast based firm, I forgot the name. And they have a factoring fund, actually. And that is quite interesting also in terms of uh, finding new ways because you don't have an exit issue there. Yeah. So that's one thing to think about new ways of exiting. And um, 
I know this problem. I used to work as a VC in a very immature market in Central and Eastern Europe and Austria, and buyback uh, was the second most. If you look at the VC statistics in Austria, after uh, bankruptcy, buyback is the biggest uh, ex exit uh, path, if you like. <laughs> and uh, so, for me, the conclusion there is: if you if um, it's, you just use the you should use a, a debt instrument rather than an equity instrument if 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 it's likely to be a buyback. Yeah. You know, uh, Oliver and Paul, if uh, we send you an enterprise that you really like and you want to buy out our shares, we're all ears. <laughs> so I'd like to I'd like to open this up to to all of you. I know we had a question here, and then we had a question from Tony, and over there. Uh, when I listen to the panel, I hear a lot of okay, capacity building, workshop, fellowship, uh, and it reminds me a bit of school. And uh, my question a little bit is, is, in your opinion, frankly, um, the quality of the entrepreneurs just not up to par to the challenge? Yeah, that could be a reason that we have to really, you know, go all through these lengthy programs. That, that's, that could be a reason. Or no. is, it, is it something else? What, is, it, is it that the process uh, is too complicated? No, it's not that. I think... Um uh, I think it's familiarity with uh, the process of uh, growth uh, businesses and raising finance for growth businesses. If you go to a place or places where uh, this is very common, like the, the West Coast and the Silicon Valley or uh, even in India, um, you don't need that much capacity building, but in places where um, the general economy or the mainstream economy is not very familiar with growth businesses and raising finance for growth businesses, and therefore you don't have these skills in the um, available, yeah, either directly within the team or or through advisors who can sort of inject that sort of uh, frame and and these concepts into the team. Then this is what you need to do. And the I keep uh, I keep uh, putting it this way: um, need for cash is not an investment case. And there's a big difference between I need cash and qualified demand for investment capital. And it not only sounds more complicated, it also is more complicated. Because what is the difference between need and demand? Uh, demand is need plus willingness and ability to pay. And how do you pay for capital? You pay with a return promise. And how, what is a return promise? It is the credible projection of delivering on your plan. Yeah? And this is between I need cash and qualified demand for investment capital lies one thing, and that's called capacity building. Um, uh, we had a question from Tawny in the middle here, and then over there in the corner. Oh, Je oh sorry. Go ahead. Jeff, go ahead. That's fine. No. Okay. Um, this is really interesting for someone who doesn't spend a lot of time dealing with impact fund managers to hear you, you know, running the gamut from all the issues you deal with. And what's particularly interesting and maybe even a little disappointing is that at no point did I hear any of the impact investment fund managers talk about impact measurement. It didn't fit into any of the calculations of, you know, from the issues you're talking about. Take it on, for granted, Jeff. On the, on the funding side. And what I'm, what I'm asking about is whether or not that's a takeaway message that really it's not really quite on your radar on this level. Because particularly with um, Stephanie uh, Neiman from B Corp is here introducing gears as an industry standard or maybe another standard that you're using somewhere where the actual impact measurement just fits into your calculations. So in, in a way it's perhaps what Audrey said. I mean, we are all, imp in, in, we are certainly impact first. The impact is the most important thing that we look for in a deal in terms of a, 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 an attractive solution that can be scaled that reaches people. We look at impact on two axes. Uh, one is called reach for us. Um, it's direct number of beneficiaries, and the second is to what extent that the business model actually improve the quality of life of less advantaged people. And we, we have developed our own metric because that's our own mission. Do we use Pulse? Yes. Do we use Gears? Yes, we look at that. Have, are we on um, working with the gin on standardizing iris criteria? Yes, we use them. But at the end of the day, they need to make sense from your own investment process, but also they need to make sense for the investee. Now, I can dump a whole list of criteria and impact criteria on the investee, and if they're not linked to the value driver of the underlying uh, business, then a lot of times I, I might run the risk of actually you know, um, using a lot of resources or make the life much more complicated. So this whole impact measurement is to be, for oneself, really specify very clearly at what kind of investor you are. 
um, and then educate the investee as well what you're looking for and what kind of criteria you have. It would be wonderful to standardize it, but just as we have in financial accounting, it took how many years to, to come up with a common agreed standard in financial accounting? And in this space, we want to have, you know, in five years, we want to have globally agreed criteria and definitions and uh, and I think we just need to be patient, and we also need to learn as a sector what really works in, uh, and adds value ultimate to the, uh, to the investee. Question from Tony. Um, Oliver, um, I have to say that I agree with you absolutely, and I think our, our um, shared background um, in Zurich kind of helps that. But my question was basic, was kind of a follow-on with that, is that what I'm hearing actually is that impact investing, from, from all the things that actually I've heard um, in the last couple of days, impact investing is impact how it's defined by the people that give money or that invest. And I hear very rarely f how that how impact, how it's understood by the people that actually receive the money are measuring it for themselves is getting is that feedback loop. So it's it's not for the investees saying here's we are impacting by X, Y, and Z. It's how the investors are, are measuring it themselves. So it's their definition, not the definition from the other side. Would you say that was a fair statement and could you comment on that? The, the best example I can give is like um, in the traditional sort of grant-based world, if you want to support an education deal, we would have a beautiful fundraiser here in Malmo. We fly down to Africa, we open a school. Um, that school will be full uh, because we're offering something for free and guarantee in a year's time we're going to be back in Malmo doing another fundraiser because the roof is leaking and we need books. So we are ultimately responsible. I'm just trying to really draw a very extreme picture here just to give that, that to your question. So we would be accountable to the donors in Malmo that we've actually you know, used the money and set up a lovely school. Now what's interesting in, in, if you start investing into organizations is that there are very interesting entrepreneurs out there who say, look, I, like to receive, um, I see that child as a client because they're paying for that service. As soon as I start paying for that service, as an example, I need to know exactly what kind of impact I'm creating with that beneficiary, and that beneficiary will, will leave my school if I'm not adding any value. So suddenly, you, have, you, you start having that loop, and I think that's, it's really important to look at the deals that we're supporting, where is that possible? Of course, we need to have impact how we define it back to our donors, but we also need to make sure that the, the ventures that we support um, know what impact they're creating, and de de develop in interesting criteria or important KPIs or criteria that they can build into their day-to-day -day operations so that they actually know that they're generating the impact. Mm. So it's, it's, and it's the interesting deals are those that, that can actually do both. I would, I would just add one small thing to that in, in terms of um, s some of the, the, the filtering processes, pre-due diligence for, for some of these types of impact investors include actually a sense of understanding well, you know, what is it about this deal that makes it social? What is it about this deal that makes it high impact? And in questioning that, you already are asking the entrepreneurs, well, what are you measuring? And what, what, what is your out, ultimate output and, and target f from the Rianta perspective? That's very much the first stage. And it's also part of our mea culpa that we're not coming in with, you know, a uh, drop-down list of 500 variables to pick from. We're just asking the entrepreneur and saying, well, what do you measure? by way of impact. Um, uh, please. Yeah, actually also to, to your question, I think it's, it is the investors who are also driving um, the codification and, the, uh, and demanding to have uh, a quantification of the impact, um, which uh, very often is simply assumed. You know, we work with children, so that's good. Yeah? Um, and uh, yeah, but what's, what's the difference that you make? Oh, well, you know, we do this and that. And then, okay, then you can say, well, and I've seen that in capacity building programs that we're running in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, that's the assumption because you do something that is worthy, that it is good, but you don't know whether it's something else is better. And um, you can break that down and, and the impact measurement or the taxonomy like IRIS, etc., helps quite a lot. And at Tonic, I mean, the two eyes is because we are a sister organization to GIN and that's also the joke. Um, um, and so we work very closely and we're implementing both GEARS and IRIS depending on the stage of the venture um, and uh, are encouraging, meaning cajoling or arm wrestling or the ventures that our investors invested in uh, to, uh, to report on this and collect that data. 
just a final thought perhaps, the way we uh, impact for us means it's always on a systemic level. So when, when we look at a deal, we basically have done, we do impact maps where we say, what are the resources that this organization need? What are the activities that this organization does? And that leads to an output. In most cases, it's, a very, it's three or four outputs which you can measure. And then we say, okay, what is this output? How does this output actually improve the quality of life of an individual? And for us, that's outcome. And there we then start mapping against you know, the five areas of uh, improved social well-being, financial well-being, material well-being, freedom and security as defined by the, those five were defined by the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment 2002. It was a global survey of what does quality of life mean for us. And if we would do a survey here, we'd probably end up with a similar set of criteria. And then that outcome is then sort of mapped, okay, how does that actually improve the system by educating children or saving mothers' lives or whatever it might be? How does that Im impact the system? And just by going through that structure, in, for us, for our investment manager to articulate, what is it that the venture does? What's the actual output? T to take that, that kind of mental process, map it out, and then sit down with the venture and say, this is how we understand what you do. It's so saying, just by reaching children, you don't know whether you're actually having a measurable impact or uh, outcome on, on that child's life. So that process for us helps tremendously, our process, but also the investees, to try and break down. We're all using impact very differently, right? It's like sustainable development. I mean, everybody has their little kind of meaning attached to it. So that at least that structure helps to, to define and sit down with the investee and, and articulate that, that kind of chain. You question over here and then up front here. Hi, this is uh, oh, James Halliday from uh, Istanbul. This goes to what Nicholas was talking about, about getting into bigger pools of capital. And I wanted to ask, what's the approach to like mutual funds or pension funds to tap into that world? And then also in terms of, um, we've been talking a lot about concessionary returns, which is essentially below market. And I think talking more broadly in terms of those bigger pools of money about how you can shape a portfolio with sort of higher returns and concessionary returns. Talk sort of more broadly about filling that picture. To, to share an example, what, what has been happening is you find a lot of sort of layered structures because a lot of the times you have, um, every investor has sort of a specific risk profile. Um, and what we've seen, like what the development agencies are doing, is like you have a first loss tranche, and then you have a senior, a junior debt, senior debt, etc. And that then enables them to attract different two pools of capital, which normally would not just go in, in, on a, in a, into a fund. So that's one way of doing it. I think it would be fantastic to go to a pension fund and tell them, look, why don't you just allocate 1% of your overall portfolio into the space and let it run. <coughs> Unfortunately, what, what we've seen is they, they need track record. Uh, then they need in certain times liquidity and you know a pension fund will never be able to invest in a fund which has you know, less than three years track record in the normal sense. You don't even need to pitch to them if you're under three years. Uh, they get started, get really excited when they see five years um, and I think in our world the, the, the kind of a lot of those institutional investors are not ready yet or cannot do it by either their fiduciary duty to invest in, in, in that. Although it would make sense because it's long term, it's creating impact Absolutely, and I think that's something that we as a sector would need to work on creatively to find these structures that would able to attract and allow that institutional capital to actually come in. Yeah. Exactly, and uh, coming back to my point before, I think this is uh, where a role of the trailblazers, both the public money and the philanthropic capital, comes in to help uh, maybe take out some of the risk that these pension funds and the big pots of money cannot take through underwriting of loss pieces and similar things um, on the Hello? Yeah. Um, and uh, I think we also have to think about um, different ways of aggregating uh, assets than funds because the, as soon as you stick the label fund on a portfolio, it, it falls into that box and says, yeah, track record, oh, no track record, okay, so it goes out. Uh, so um, we need to think about ways to pool capital in different ways than uh, the, the, the ways that we have now because you, you fall into those boxes, you follow those processes, and if you look at the amount of capital that the average pension fund manager needs to deploy in a year, uh, it's just crazy. I once sat next to the guy who's doing private equity for Pension Plan Canada and asked him, yeah, would you be interested to invest in our 50 million target Austrian venture fund? And he said, no, 
uh, it doesn't move the needle. I have three people, we need to get out six billion per year, and my venture allocation is 1.2 billion, and I gave that to a manager, and they take care of that. So. <laughs> How inspiring. <laughs> um, question here. Uh, just f uh, first, first a comment, Ross, I, I think that the most valuable um, advice I heard uh, all this whole time was, was you saying you're not investable. Not to me directly, but I say in, in general, meaning, meaning um, social entrepreneurs evaluate yourself and don't waste your time chasing um, in, in investors, funders, et cetera, until you really, really know what you want. I think that's extremely valuable. And as um, a social entrepreneur, we really have to, to take that to heart and, and take that back to the operation. Um, secondly, I, I, I've heard that the market in itself does not have enough investable businesses, therefore it's not moving. So the, uh, in the conventional market, we have businesses knowing very well what to communicate to potential investors, except during the, the dot-com era, right? So what do we as the social entrepreneurs have to do in order to make your job easier? Beside the, here's the impact on society, because I hear whenever I hear investors or funders saying, we love uh, that, you social entrepreneurs have these great impacts and we, and we want the same thing, that to me is a very scary thing because I think it's a little bit of false marketing and false hope for, for us. So I rather hear a potential investors funder saying, these are the hard stuff that you need to tell me that, you can, uh, that, that we can do in order for me to look at you. And that, uh, that won't waste your time, won't waste our time because we do not have the human resource to, to keep going to all these SOCAP events. I, I <laughs> that that's the most popular comment in the room, huh? <laughs> um, except expensive. for with the SoCap team. Um, no, I I I have two comments to that because I think that's um, probably the most relevant uh, comment to outline the the real tension that we're feeling. So I agree that. Um, investors don't think that there are enough investable things out there. Um, I also think that investors, and, and I'm, and I, you know, I'll talk about our experience building village capital programs, I'm one of them. Investors um, often, myself having done this, uh, take a build it and they will come approach, saying look, we're doing this program, we're in this place, there are a lot of entrepreneurs here, we're gonna announce the program and we've got money on the table, and sure, all these people come out of the woodwork and they will want money, and then, you know, we've had programs in very entrepreneurial places and we see the applications and we say, there have gotta be more people out there than that. Um, and the answer is that there is, but if investors spent as one-tenth the time recruiting entrepreneurs as they do recruiting money, which is the same as fundraising, the, the deal flow would be a whole lot better. Our best program ever was in Brazil, where we um, we shaped our recruitment strategy off of how this has worked, and it's worked well in China, Kenya, and, and in the US since then, where we said, okay, we're gonna learn everything we need to know about the health, education, and financial services sector in Brazil. Those are the three sectors that we picked. And we did what Oliver was saying. We went to the banks and said, who's applying for loans that you're rejecting? And we went to the industry associations, we said, who looks kind of like this and is dealing with poor customers? And we got 10 companies, and nine of them got funded by investors in the three months of the program. Um, six of those got funded by non-self-described, or five of them got funded by non-self-described impact investors. They got funded by rich people that we invited to our events and said, that's a great company. <laughs> you guys are doing well. Um, and we've, we've, we've replicated that over and over again. So we've spent a lot less time in program management and a lot more time in recruiting. So part of the answer is it's our job to get more fundable companies. The bit of advice I would give to you is uh, the best fundraising advice I ever got is uh, to, to keep as a mantra, no is my second favorite answer. Um, be like, look, I love yes. No is my second favorite answer, but then followed up with what are the conditions under which you would say yes? And if the conditions are in no world would I invest in your business, then you just stop talking to that person and you have you save some time. Um, but I have, I mean, I, I, I'm fundraising for village capital programs and I say, you know, people say, well, if you can bring me 20 companies through this recruitment strategy and I'm interested in 10 of them, then I would put 25,000 into this. And so we had a benchmark to shoot for. We got 20 companies. The people put in the 25,000 into the program and, and it worked. It's not always that easy, but, but 
Um, if your investor is your customer as part of the fundraise, figuring out what the customer wants by putting them on the spot is something that is always productive. I wonder if there are any other do's and don'ts um, from, from your experience, from your respective experiences that should be shared with um, prospective um, applic applicants for funding. I mean, the one that I, the one that comes to mind most quickly for me is um, it's really important to have clarity on what it is your fun wh w exactly what it is you need, and uh, in what form and by what time. And so, when asked the question, "How much? What is your investment requirement?" Um, the preferred response is not, "Well, how much is your average ticket size?" Um, which has happened several times. Um, so that's from from our experience. Um. I'm also involved in the capacity building program for social entrepreneurs in Central and Eastern Europe. And what we do there to facilitate the initial discussion is to say, here is your, not like elevator pitch, but your 10 second pitch. Uh, to say, this is what I do, now give me your reaction, and then I will tailor everything that comes after that, the more detailed uh, stuff, to what you're actually looking for. So you say, like, you give 10, 10 seconds, this is what we do. And you can do that even in a formal presentation where you have a one-page summary and, and then use the rest of the presentation, the deck, more as a smorgasbord. And you say, look, this is what we do. This is what I have in my agenda. And, and so tell me what you're interested in. And very often, um, like the investor will hone in on one particular thing, whatever they're interested in. And then you can spend most time on that. And it's really good, good selling and good customer um, trying to find out what your customer is looking for. Because one thing that every company has in common, even a no-product company, is every company needs to sell. Yeah? If, you, if you have a product, you sell that. If you don't have a product, you sell shares in your company. Yeah? Or you sell your assets. Yeah? But you always have to sell something. Yeah? And the person to whom you're selling, that's your customer. And, and in, in a way, um, to, to have a very be able to articulate where you would like to go with your business, forward-looking, um, in the sense of saying where you are now and what your ambition is and what kind of other resources you need as well, and not just, just funding, but be as specific as possible on, on that. Because a lot of times the business plans that we've looked at, if you look at the numbers, I mean, they are extremely ambitious, in most always. 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 That's... Um, but that's good because we want ambitious entrepreneurs, right? So that's a, that's a great starting point. But then is to, to actually in, engage, and you will see when you interact with the investor what kind of questions the investor is also asking you, whether this is someone that you want to work with together. Because a lot of times you, you actually enter a, a long-term sort of engagement, five years or so, you want to make sure that the chemistry is right, that there's trust there, that you can also go to the entrepreneur, uh, sorry, to the investor and say, look, my CFO just fell off a horse, please help me. Right, that you feel that, that you can be that open about what doesn't work, what works. I mean, once you get beyond that stage of, of selling the, 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 where you want to go, the great picture is then over time to really feel whether that's an investor that you want to work with. Because we're not here to just write checks. Then you can go to a bank and say, I need a loan. Thanks very much. No more questions asked. And I just use that loan. But we're talking about a much more engaged form of, of investing. We have one last question here in the front. Oh, thanks. Uh, Christoph from The Hub. Um, I have one question. I um, think it was the idea was very appealing not to go for the usual suspects, um, whom everybody is approaching um, in terms of impact investors. But what are the new ideas and, and maybe different, maybe a little bit also structured approaches of how do we find the non-usual suspects? Of course, telling everyone on a conference who you are and not go into a kind of conventional impact investor conference is, is one, but I'm, but I'm sure you have some ideas of how, how to find high net worth individuals that haven't been in the sectors, investors that don't know about social entrepreneurship. What, what are the other ideas that you have? Ask the usual suspects is one, is <laughs> his one uh, response. Yeah, there, I mean, uh, we are, Probably these are. This is such a, especially on the family office side, and looking for these, you know, these uh, individuals who who happen to have interests and in, in deep pockets. Um, they're so difficult. They're not. They're not searchable anywhere. They're very difficult to find. Um, the chances are that a couple of us uh, know somebody who knows somebody, um, which unfortunately is not a good answer. I mean, I think. I think. I think. Uh, um 
figure out the world that the people you do know play in for specific, be, be as specific as possible about what your ask is. So for example, um, the advice I always give to hubs is there are a lot more real estate investors in the world than there are social enterprise investors. And in Atlanta, if I were going to raise money for some real estate boondoggle, it's, it's way easier than trying to explain, oh, but we make impact, whatever. And then you can get meetings with 20 real estate investors and you'll find one of the 20 might, might, might click with you on mission. Um, you know, Grey Ghost is essentially a family office. Audrey's Investor is essentially a family office. The family office world is very, very tight. So, you know, you know, I advise entrepreneurs to, to talk to family office managers and say, who is interested in doing innovative things in local agriculture? We had a company in New Orleans raise $500,000 from family offices interested in agriculture. I think, I think um, figure out what slice of what you do is understandable somewhat to someone that's never heard of SOCAP and then ask who you know who does a lot of that. Maybe not a straight answer to your question, but something more general. Um, like echoing what you said before, writing a check is really easy. Yeah? What entrepreneurs do, yeah? investing their energy, investing their life savings sometimes and their life into uh, a venture is, is much more difficult than just investing the cash. Yeah? And so I think uh, there is nothing wrong with you projecting that first. Second, investors' raison d'etre is to invest. Yeah? So the default option is to invest and then you start looking for reasons to not invest. And if you don't find any, you go back to default. So if you have something that uh, fits this investor's mission, you're doing her a favor um, by offering this. Yeah? This is a partnership. And um, I mean, I'm I'm opening the secret books of the investor perspective here, but but you should you should approach an investor with that with that offer. You have something to sell that this person possibly wants to buy, yeah, and and it's a it's a partnership of equals, yeah, uh, but um, it's very very seldomly is it approached from the entrepreneur side in this way because we assume that the that the that the power relationship is is different uh, because somebody has the money and somebody wants the money, but in in effect it, it's not uh, because what we want is good deals, and um, and and we that that's how, that's what we do. We're looking for good deals, and if you are one and the fit is there, then bingo. I would just um, then add one final note and 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 then to to echo my. My thanks to all my peer panelists here. Um, this has been a great session. I hope it's been interesting for you all. I would just add one one final thought is that um, as important and tantamount to the substance of what it is that's being presented is the doorway through which you walk. And so investing the time and resource in finding the right way uh, to be <laughs> um, introduced or connected to somebody, particularly for these types of smaller uh, smaller outfits is probably uh, an important piece because um, I've seen so many situations where it's um, it's so relationship driven. In this, um, it's it's unfortunate that it's so relationship driven because um, it's just a tighter net. It's harder to penetrate, but um, all the more uh, I guess um, uh, all the more um, rewarding. rewarding it is, yeah, for the entrepreneur that does actually get through these nets and does get the right introductions. Um, but I would say, uh, just ask a lot of questions and go up to people and talk to talk to as many of, you know, th these types of investors as you see, uh, and the doors will open. Um, thank you all very much. Uh, it was a really interesting conversation. Um, as follow-ups, I'm sure uh, we're all available uh, for, for further discussion and questions, uh, whether online or offline. And thank you to our hosts here at SOCAP. Thank you.